Well, this year for Christmas, we were getting the tree in place and we were deciding how we wanted to decorate it this year. Last year, we had a glam tree, a lot of gold, a lot of silver, metallics. This year, we decided we wanted to do something a little more fun, something that had a little more memory to it. And so we started pulling out all of the ornaments from the boxes. And I remember pulling out a few of them that had my beautiful wife in there, but she was like first grade, so she looked a little bit different. Um, But we're pulling these up, and I remember pulling these up and just looking back at them and and thinking about the ones that I had made. One in particular was made of popsicle sticks, and they had just been glued together. There was a picture in the middle created some kind of a frame. There were others that were cut like snowflakes with pictures in the middle, and I remembered making those and taking them home to my parents and just being so proud of this gift that I had created for my parents and seeing it up on the Christmas tree kind of made my Christmas for me. But with those kind of ornaments, there's always memories that come back with them, whether it was times from first grade or stories of things that happened that year, or maybe your family likes to give out a different ornament every single year. And so every ornament carries its own story. There's something about Christmas time that causes us to remember, to look back and to think about the things that have happened throughout the year, or even think about things that have happened throughout our lives. Remembering is a very powerful thing. Remembering doesn't just bring back memories or thoughts, but remembering can even bring back tastes, sounds. Remembering can take you back to a very specific time, a very specific moment, and you're living in that moment, no matter how many years have passed. But remembering can be even more powerful than that, because Remembering, remembering can go beyond taking you back to a specific time in history, but remembering can actually change your history. As you look back and realize the way that maybe we've lived our lives, knowing we don't want to continue living that way. And we, can, we look ahead to our future and say, I want it to be different. Remembering back can actually change our futures. And that's where I want to go tonight. And I'm going to start with a story from Moses, and I'll explain why in a second. But the book of Deuteronomy, I thought it'd be nice if we read through it together this evening, but there's a service at 9.15 tomorrow morning. So I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a few highlights from the book of Deuteronomy. I went through and, and picked out a bunch of different verses where Moses is commanding the people to remember or don't forget. And I began to categorize where he had specifically said these things. There's some specific moments where he says, do not forget God. Do not forget the ways that he's led you. Don't forget the ways that he's protected you. Don't forget the ways that he has provided for you. Don't forget the ways that he has saved you. Don't forget. Because this is actually going to help you to trust him in the future. You see, in in this book of Deuteronomy, We find Moses at the very end of it, up on the top of a mountain. And this is a place we have become familiar with seeing Moses. Moses would often go up to the top of the mountain, or God would call him to the top of the mountain, and he would have his moments of fellowshipping with God, just Moses and God. A time to commune, a time to get away from everything that was happening down below, just to be with God. I just imagine Moses up there, Because God has just told him, Moses, your life is coming to an end. And I want you to look at this promised land. After 40 years of traveling through the desert, look ahead at this land that I am going to be giving to my people. You won't get to enter. You're going to die before they get there. But I imagine Moses looking back at all the times he was up at the top of that mountain pleading on behalf of this Hebrew people that he was leading. He's pleading with them, pleading with God. God, save these people. God, don't destroy these people. God, I know they've turned their backs on you once again, but God, don't destroy these people. God, think of your name. God, remember these people. Now Moses has just given his last speech, if you will, his last appeal. And this last appeal has been to the Hebrew people. He's not appealing on their behalf before God. Now he's appealing to them and he's saying, do not forget. And he goes even further and he says, don't get lost in this transition. There are things that you must remember. 
Don't forget the ways of the Lord. Don't forget his commands. Don't forget his promises. And as you're entering into this land that he has promised you, don't forget the many promises that he has given along the way. Because these promises and these commands that he gave you in these past 40 years were not only true for this time, but they are true for the future. And they're true for this time that you are entering into. And he says, in speaking of these last 40 years, don't forget of the character that has been built inside of you. And don't forget all the things that God has been doing within you these last 40 years. Because this is going to carry you through into this promised land. He says, don't let your hearts be deceived by the evil that you are going to see. And don't conform to the ways of those that you will be living among. Don't worship as they worship. Don't worship the gods that they worship. Do not allow your hearts to be deceived in this time ahead. He pleads with these people and he pours his heart out to them. And now he goes up and he's with God and he's fellowshipping with God and he gets the worst news that he could possibly get. And God says, Moses, that was great. But you're probably aware of this. The people, in just a very short time, they're going to forget. And they're going to turn from me. And they're going to go back to living in these ways and they will conform. And Moses, these blessings that I want to give to my people, I'm not going to be able to because they will forget me. The sad thing is these old habits die hard and people forget. And it's why we have got to remember. So after looking back on a history of reminders, I want us to look ahead now. I want us to look ahead to a Christian role of reminding. And we're going to jump ahead to Peter. I want you to go ahead and turn to 2 Peter if you have your Bibles here tonight. Peter then takes the role of Moses. We actually find Peter in a very similar situation that we just found Moses. Peter has come to the end of his life. This very Peter that walked on water as he met with Jesus out on the water. This very, this very Peter that would walk with Jesus every single day doing ministry with him. This, this very Peter that, that doubted Jesus and this, this very Peter that denied Jesus. We now find Peter at the very end of his life after he has matured and he has been an incredible witness for Jesus Christ and a very changed man, a brand new man. We find this Peter at the end of his life and he is pleading with God's people. I want to read just a couple passages. This first one is from the first chapter of 2 Peter verses 12 through 15 and it reads like this. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Peter's desire is that this plea, his teaching, his reminders will actually outlive him. This is what Moses was happening or hoping would happen, that his, his plea with the people in writing down these scriptures would outlive him, that these reminders would go farther than he would because he knew that his body would fail him and he would not be able to lead these people forever. And he just wanted to remind them of these truths. And Peter is saying the very same thing. I hope that these words that I give you and stirring up these reminders within you will outlast me. And in 2 Peter, then in chapter 3, as he's wrapping up this letter, the second letter that he has written to them, he then says this as he's beginning to close out the letter. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through those apostles. I wanted to use this tonight as an illustration because I think it's a little bit difficult to fully understand everything that Peter is saying here. So I'll get to this in a moment. But what Peter is leading to is it really doesn't matter if it's Moses or he mentions the prophets 
And the prophets were the ones that were speaking on behalf of God in the Old Testament times. And really, they were reminding the people of God's word as God's people would stray. They would bring forth God's word to them, trying to pull them back. And, and Peter's saying, it doesn't matter if it's Moses or the prophets or if it's me here today or somebody in the future. He's saying our Christian role of reminding actually falls on every single Believer, everyone that is a part of the family of God, everyone that is here tonight, everyone that calls himself a child of God, it is your responsibility as a child of God to be a reminder for those that you love, those that are in this church. And the funny thing is, just like with Moses, a lot of times, a lot of times, these are the people that we love the most and we want to remind them. And sometimes, sometimes these reminders are not the best thing, right? For me, for me, reminders in my house had a very negative connotation. When I was growing up, if my father used the word reminder, there were instant tears coming from my face because that, that didn't just mean, let me remind you of something that you forgot. It meant, Jonathan, go and get the paddle out of the drawer because you're gonna get a spanking. See, reminder to me was, Jonathan, you have forgotten some of the instructions that I gave to you. And therefore, I'm going to remind you with a little lesson. Reminders for me, very, very negative as I was growing up. I didn't like reminders. But often reminders are the ones that we are, we are going to people that we love and we want to give this to them. We know that it is good for them. It is necessary. It is something that we need. And so this is what I think of as a reminder. Peter says, I want to stir up inside of you. And what he says is this is actually not something that is new to you. He said these are old things. These are things that you have already learned. I'm not trying to tell you something new. I'm trying to stir something up inside of you that maybe has settled. Something that that maybe you have forgotten in a sense because it's no longer at the forefront of your memory. And so what I want to do is I want to stir something up inside of you. And I want to bring it back to life because it's gotten a little bit stale. It's stagnant and it's settled and you've forgotten. So he says, I want to stir this up in you. Moses, Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, maybe you remember chapter six. Moses says, look, I want to stir something up inside of you. And this is how I want you to remember because you cannot afford to forget. He says, I want you to impress this on your children. I want you to talk about this when you sit down and when you rise up. I want you to be thinking about these things and I want you to be talking about these things every time you lay down at night. I want you to talk about them every time you are walking somewhere. In fact, I want you to go beyond that. I want you, I want you to tie them on your wrists so that you are constantly looking at them every time you use your hands. He says, I want you to go beyond that. I want you to post these on your door frames. I want you to post them on your gates as you're walking out. What he's saying is I want you to do whatever it is going to take for you to remember. One of the most difficult times to preach is during Christmas because everyone knows the Christmas story. And you'll find pastors that are constantly looking for a new angle, whether it's going to the prophets to try and preach the story from there, or maybe like we did this year, going going to 1 John and looking at his account and trying to find the Christmas story in one of these epistles that have been written. We're looking for a different angle, a way to bring this story because it's so important to be reminded of this. And it's not just something that we need once a year. But we've got to be reminded of the story. We've got to be reminded of the truths of scriptures. So Moses says, put it on everything that you have so that you don't forget. Write it on everything that you own. Impress it upon your children. Speak with them as you're walking. Whatever it is going to take, speak of it, think of it, so that you never forget. As we sat around this year as, as a family, my father asked me one question. He asked all of us as a family, and he said, 
What is one thing that you've been reminded of this year because of the Christmas story? One thing that maybe you had forgotten. One thing that maybe had settled. And as you look at the story of Jesus Christ, you'd forgotten about this. And immediately my mind went to the series that we had been looking at, God reaching down. And there was one thing in particular that hit me. And when God reached down and came to this earth, and he came in the form of Jesus, and Jesus walked and did ministry, and Jesus got to that point where he said, I'm leaving, but I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was here to stay with us, and he's living inside of us. What was impressed upon me this year was that when God came down, God didn't just come down and meet certain needs while he was here, but God came down and he stayed here with us. He was Emmanuel, God with us, and he lives inside of us. And when, when there is something that is lacking inside of me, whether it is my joy that is gone my strength that is missing, or maybe it's a truth that I have forgotten. The Holy Spirit is there inside of me, living in me. And he actually manifests himself inside of me, providing me with what I need in those moments. The daily bread that Jesus tells us to pray for, the Holy Spirit then becomes exactly what we need when Jesus says, if you are a father and you give good gifts, at Christmas we give gifts. If you are a father and you know how to give good gifts, how much more does the heavenly father know how to give the Holy Spirit? Whatever it is that you need. And the Spirit himself is there living in us, giving us exactly what we need. For me, that was my Christmas reminder. He's here with me and he is everything that we need. Christ truly is enough. And then Peter, as he's coming to the end of his letter, he says, and this, this, these are the qualities that I want you to remember. This is what I'm wanting to stir up inside of you. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 11. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now notice as, as Peter is speaking here, he's not laying out a list of do's and don'ts. But what he's saying here is it's got to start with faith. But there are ways to supplement this faith. And I want to remind you of these things. As it was for Moses in saying, Talk about all of these things. Look at these things at all times. Here's Peter's little list of this is what can be done to supplement the faith that you already have. And he says, if you do these things, you will not fall. You won't fail in following Christ. This is my reminder to you, he says. This is what I want to outlive my life here because my time is coming to an end. And so he brings out a few qualities, characteristics, and he says, I want, you, I want you to supplement your faith with these things. I want you to supplement it with virtue. 
This is the moral excellence. And he's saying this is not going to bring you to salvation, but this is what is going to supplement your faith. This is what is going to grow your faith. This is going to be a reminder to you as you are walking in faith, a life of moral excellence. And with virtue, with knowledge, knowledge is not going to bring you to salvation. However, As you grow in knowledge, as you grow in your understanding of Jesus Christ, as you grow in your understanding of following him, your faith will be increased in that. As you are continuing to walk in these things, continue to add to that self-control and steadfastness and godliness and brotherly affection and with brotherly affection, love. What he's saying is I want to see an entire person that is completely transformed. And he goes a little bit deeper with each one of these things until he gets to the heart. And this is where we find the art of remembering. And we looked at what a Christian reminder is, and we know that it's the responsibility of every believer, but yet the responsibility still falls on each one of us. And this is where Peter is getting at. I hope that there are people in your life that you can look up to, someone that can speak into your life, someone that can remind you, someone that can say, correct, maybe even rebuke. If there are things in your life that you know, this is not right, this is not honoring to God. And when I look at this list, godliness, moral excellence, this wouldn't necessarily characterize my life, but I have someone that can speak into my life to bring those up and to actually stir up these things inside of me. But what Peter is saying is, it starts in your heart. And the true art of remembering takes place in here. And as you are being stirred up, maybe this sounds a little bit weird, but as you are being stirred up, my question to you would be, what aroma is given off as things are being stirred? What I mean by that is, if what is inside of you is good and pleasing, as you are being stirred up, it's going to be something that is sweet, something that is good, something that is fruitful. Peter says here, if these things are neglected, if they're looked beyond, it's because we're walking blindly. We are so nearsighted, he says, we can only see something that is so up close in front of us, and we are walking as if we have completely forgotten. But if we are being stirred up and things are fruitful inside of us, we give off this good smelling aroma and we actually see the fruit of the Spirit actually taking place inside of us. And it is produced through the ways that we interact with others. And it is produced through a life change that we see where we actually get to watch a life of faithfulness, moral excellence, a life where there is godliness, a life where there is goodness, a life where there is brotherly affection and love that is taking place because we have been stirred up and things are good. But he's saying if that's not the case, if when you are stirred up, something foul comes out of there. If when you are stirred up and someone is trying to reach into your life, speak into your life to correct, possibly rebuke, or maybe it's just even to teach, but it is not taken well, then he says, the heart is in a bad place. Remembering won't happen, but what's going to be produced is something that is unfruitful. It's going to be bitterness. What's going to be produced is something that that is going to be foul to others, and you're going to lash out, and you're going to look to destroy one another rather than acting in affection and acting in love and receiving that in love, something foul will come. And Peter's saying, don't allow that to be the case in your life, in your heart, or else the reminders are going to do no good and there will be no remembering that takes place. The art of remembering takes place in the heart. And it's a matter of an attitude of the heart. So as you go from this place, my question to you would be, is there someone in your life that can speak into your life that you will allow to stir up? Someone that you will say, I want to be teachable. I want to learn. 
I want to be corrected if necessary because I want my life to be a life of godliness and I want my life to be something that I can impress upon my children. And I want to become somebody that can then be a reminder to others, to those that I love, because I want my life to outlive me. And when I look at this church and being part of the body of this church, I want my life to outlive in the way that I remind, in the way that I instruct, in the way that I build up. But we've got to know it takes place first in our own hearts. Is there someone that you would say can stir up inside of you Maybe it's at home. It might be at work. But I wonder, is that person at home? And sometimes the people that are the hardest to listen to are the ones that we're the most close with, the ones that we love the most. And I think when my wife speaks to correct or even rebuke something in my life, will I allow her to be a reminder to me and will I allow her to lead me, lead me into a life of holiness and godliness? Or am I going to lash out? What does that look like in your homes? What impression are you making on your spouse? What impression are you making on your kids? Is there someone that can speak into your life? And then my next question would be, is there someone that you can remind is there someone that you can speak into, someone that you know maybe just needs to be stirred up and maybe done in love, not done in anger, but done in love, wanting to build up, wanting to lead that person more deeply into a life of godliness and goodness, a life of, of, of committed, passionate pursuit of Jesus Christ? Is there someone that you are pouring into, speaking into? that you can then stir up, just as we saw Moses and Peter doing in our text this evening. I still have 52 seconds left. Let me close us in prayer. <laughs> we'll worship with one more song. And as we worship in this last song, I just want you to consider maybe what God wants to do in your heart as we sing this last one together. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that you did come to this earth. And I thank you, Jesus, that you truly are enough for each one of us. And, and sometimes, Lord, we just have got to be reminded of that, whether it's through your words or, or even through singing these songs that proclaim your truths. Jesus, I pray that above all, that you would be the one working inside of us, stirring up whatever it is that you may be wanting to do inside of our hearts. I pray, Jesus, that you would reveal things to us that we have been blinded to, these things that we are so nearsighted that we cannot see. I pray, Jesus, that you would reveal those things to us so that we can walk closely with you in fellowship with you. And I pray this in your name. Amen.